is a yeah that has been observed by uh, other authors the so-called uh, double descent phenomenon and so what is it so in in the statistics textbooks uh, and how we teach it in our classes the, the bias variance trade off is as, as follows right we have if we say we take a, a method say neural networks and um, then we um, uh, we, 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 we plot the, the, the risk, the, the generalization error versus the number of parameters of this method. Um, then we say this, we, we see this sort of U shaped curve, um, where if we have very few parameters in our method, then we just don't have enough uh, flexibility. The approximation error is not good enough. And as we, uh, add more and more parameters, the approximation error becomes better and we come to a sort of a, a sweet spot because afterwards uh, we come to um, we come to a regime where we where we um, over parameterize and then the the method becomes uh, worse again. And so the, the general idea is that uh, yeah, so classically in a classical sense we would think, well, if we just add more and more parameters, the method becomes uh, worse. Um, but what happens in practice for many machine learning methods is uh, that we come to the, a new regime where we, again, uh, decrease with, uh, the error of the, the generalization error decreases a second time. And this is this double descent phenomenon, which you can see on the right side of um, the uh, plot. And uh, so most of the modern machine learning methods, they are in this highly over parameterized regime where we again decrease. And so, so where does the, why does it work? Is because the, in this over parameterized regime, the, the, the way we fit the model to the data, for instance, via stochastic gradient descent, that also induces a sort, certain type of, of um, penalization and regularization. And therefore we also can get good statistical performance in, in the highly over-parameterized regime, which is quite counterintuitive and really contradicts um, all the classical textbook statistics um, um, summaries of bias variance trade-off. Okay, so and because people have observed this phenomenon and they are very excited about this, so there's uh, now a lot of discussion going on um, to which extent the bias variance trade-off is something that can be maybe beaten by the uh, modern over parameterized machine learning methods. So there's a very influential paper on neural networks by uh, Gemont and co-authors in 92. And they say, well, neural networks are, they have suffered exactly from the same problems as, as every other method, uh, non parametric method for uh, yeah, uh, fitting a function to data. And, and particularly, they also um, have to obey the variance trade of the, the, the bias variance trade of uh, in the same way as any other method uh, has to, to obey it. But then uh, this, because of the double descent phenomenon, um, there are now many uh, papers on RKF that claim something different. They say, for instance, this um, this is not true, and um, the neural networks over parameterized neural networks they can somehow beat the bias variance trade off. Um, and then they make some some experiments and they they study that, and it looks very promising in in the sense. But what we would like to have is a sort of a, a proof: is that now true or not? Is it possible that uh, there are methods that can beat the bias variance trade off. For instance, they think about um, a method that um, has a very negligible bias and that doesn't balance bias and variance and still has good performance. Is that possible or not? Or is that a sort, a sort of a, a universal boundary that no method can, can cross this bias variance trade off? Um, and that's exactly the question that we started and that we wanted to answer. And that is the the beginning of our project.
and maybe just as a sort of uh, spoiler, uh, what we find is that um, bias variant straight up is universal, and no method uh, can can beat it. But the, the question is how you how you phrase bias variant straight up. What is really the correct uh, concept of bias variant straight up? I think this is the the tricky bit in the whole and the whole construction here. Okay, so let me um, uh, go on a bit more detail. Um, because we, yeah, after um, thinking about this for a while, we, we, it became more and more clear to us that the bias variant straight off is something fundamental, and there's no, no way to beat this by any method whatsoever, um, and also not by over parameterized neural networks. And so what we wanted to come up with is a mathematical proof that this is true. And that means somehow we need a, a way to say, uh, to, to prove that no method can, can be better than yeah, a certain, uh, can, for instance, if you fix uh, the bias to be of a certain order, the variance has, has to be of a different order. That, that is what we want to prove. Now, this really reminds you probably of this Minimax framework that we have for statistical methods. They, the Minimax framework tells us that there's no method that can um, have a certain um, very fast um, rate. Okay, so it gives us lower bounds, universal lower bounds on the generalization error or the statistical risk that has that that holds for any method, what whatever method you you come up with. And something similar we want to develop now, but not for the for the global risk, but for the bias variance trade-off. And it, once we can do that, we can, for instance, say a lot of things, right? We can maybe go back here. We can say that uh, this curve here cannot be beaten by any other method. So it really gives a lot of information once we have these universal lower bounds. Now, um, OK, so uh, of course, there. Are, there is a bit of uh, related literature, but it's very, very little actually what, what is, uh, has been done previously in the statistical uh, community on, on this topic. Uh, one, um, one article is by Mark Lowe in 95, and he somehow provides uh, a complete characterization of the bias variance trade off in the so called Gaussian white noise model, which is essentially the, the non parametric regression model. Um, for functionals, okay? So he just considers functionals and he uses a very specific trick, namely that for functionals, somehow you have a worst case direction and then you can, once you understand that, you can somehow link it to a one-dimensional problem and uh, for the one-dimensional problem, you can somehow do explicit computations and that gives really the, the full characterization here. And another paper that we found is a more qualitative behavior it says that, um, well, if you have a method that is, in a sense, asymptotically unbiased, um, then it must have unbounded variance. So in, in overall, it's a, it's a bad method. So to, and that also only applies to, uh, to functionals. And you will see later the um, bias variance trade off for functionals is somehow a bit easier than if you look, for instance, for bias variance trade off for, say, um, prediction error for or regression or something more more complicated. Um, uh, hi, Johannes. Uh, Johannes, yeah, sorry sure. to interrupt. So, sure, yeah. uh, could you make your slides uh, full screen because some okay. listeners, uh, some audience cannot see the the word yeah, the sure. words or characters. I would be happy. Like, yeah. Um, okay. But I don't really know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, let me check. Should be in the view. To be in the view option, right? And the view options. Okay. Give me one second. Yeah. You made it the full screen. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can I can first make them full screen. No, I can't. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, if I okay, let's let's see. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. Of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you so, so much. So now it thank should you. be better, yeah? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, sorry. Cool. Uh, I, I wasn't prepared actually to give the talk live because I, 
So the organizers asked me to pre-record it, and I sent them the video. So I thought it will be just uh, the, 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 the video will be played in the end. But I'm happy to give a, a live talk as, as well. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, um, this is just on the on the related literature. So there's very little actually, just for estimation of function, which is not so interesting, say from the machine learning perspective. Um, Okay, so how do we prove actually the, a lower bound on the bias variance trade off? Well, this is a very old uh, thing, the, the Kramarau inequality, and that can be used to, to do this. Um, so the Kramarau lower bound tells us that uh, the variance of an estimator is lower bounded by um, uh, the. the, the a fraction um, and in the numerator we have uh, one plus the derivative of the bias with respect to the parameter and then uh, everything is squared and this is divided by the Fisher information so that only holds for parametric problems but you can already see how how the argument works here so suppose um, we the, the bias is uh, small everywhere then it's impossible that uh, the derivative of the bias uh, is, say, smaller than minus a half, right? Because if it's minus a half, somehow it would, uh, uh, would the, the bias would become large at some point in the parameter space. So therefore, there must be a point where, um, where, where, the, where the, the derivative of the bias is larger than minus a half. And... Um, then this, this leads then to a lower bound uh, for the variance. Okay, so the, the variance would be then lower bounded at this point by uh, one quarter uh, over the Fisher information. And uh, so, that, so that means essentially small bias leads to, to a lower bound on the variance. Um, and this is essentially the, the basic idea, but the, the problems here is uh, of course, this only ever applies here. The Kramarau law bound only applies to parametric problems. We need the, the Fisher information, so we need to be able to take derivatives with respect to the parameters and so on. So that does not really apply to complex, high-dimensional, non-parametric uh, problems. Okay. So the question is, how do we extend this very basic argument to something more complicated? And what we want to to do is essentially we want to to, to do that in the same way as as it's done for um, for the minimax lower bounds, where we relate it more to concepts from information theory, like uh, kubert leibler uh, distances, chi-square distances, these type of things. So how do we how do we do that? So we what we do in order to um, generalize that to to more complex models. What the, the, the argument from the Kramer-Rau lower bound is we. Um, introduce so-called uh, what we call change of expectation inequalities and they have essentially the same role as the or essentially the same sort of argument can be done for such a change of expectation inequality or can be done for the Kramer-Rau uh, lower bound and so what is our we, we derive from the paper several versions of this change of expectation inequalities i just give you one version of it and um, so what we have is a number of um, probability measures, uh, say P0 to Pm, and they are defined all on the same probability space. And then we define a matrix. So probably you have heard about the chi-square uh, divergence before. What we do is we define a matrix that has the chi-square divergences on the main diagonal. And it has uh, yeah, some other entries on the off-diagonal entries that uh, the off-diagonal entries are a bit different. And they are defined by the formula here on the slide. And we call that uh, the chi-square divergence matrix. And now what we have is an inequality that resembles a bit a sort of non-asymptotic version of the Kramer-Rau law bound. And it says that the variance at, for one parameter, namely if the data are generated under P0, are lower bounded by a quadratic form that is um, it contains the differences of the expectations, and that uh, also says why, why, why it's called the change of expectation inequality, the difference of the expectations. Um, and then it also involves the inverse of the, the uh, chi-square divergence, divergence matrix. And if the inverse 
So the chi-square divergence matrix can be shown to be a positive semi-definite matrix. And if the inverse does not exist, you can also take a, a generalized inverse that doesn't really matter. OK, so why, how can we use this inequality to prove lower bounds on the bias variance trade-off? Well, we uh, suppose that the bias would be, would be uh, small everywhere. Then that means essentially also this um, we, we can say something about the delta vector here. Okay, so in my recorded slides, I, I could make some annotations here on the slides. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, possible uh, today. But uh, somehow, if you have small bias, that means essentially you can say that the delta vector is actually quite large in certain situations. And that gives you then a, a good lower bound for the variance. And that is essentially the, the, the basic idea that we use in order to prove lower bounds for the bias variance trade-off. Now, I don't want to, to, to go into too much detail here on how it's done uh, in practice. I just want to give you a few examples of what we can prove. Uh, so the first one is non-parametric regression, but probably, as you know, in the statistics literature, we, we don't like this regression model so much because of this discretization effect. So we take a continuous a version of it, and this is called the Gaussian white noise model. But you can just think about the, the classical non-parametric regression uh, framework. And so what we have is what we can prove for the bias variance trade-off is an inequality that I uh, have uh, here in the, in, as a display in, in, on the slide. And it says that if you take the worst case bias over the parameter space, and you raise it to a power one over beta, where beta is the, the smoothness of your uh, function, and you multiply it with the variance, then this has always to be lower bounded by one over n for any method, whatever you can imagine. Okay, so whether you take a neural network or a classical non parametric regression um, um, method, um, doesn't matter. So this is a universal lower bound that applies to, to all methods. And that says essentially, because we take the product, that says if you take the, the bias, if you want to buy the bias small, that automatically implies that the variance has to be large. And if the variance is small, the bias has to be large. And that is really the bias variance trade off. And this is really what generates you also this U shaped curve that we have seen before. And there's no way to, to beat that by any machine learning uh, approach. Um, and um, actually, also, this is a sharp lower bound because for most estimators, we can actually also derive an upper bound for that. And it has exactly the same order as the lower bound that we derive here. Secondly, also, maybe a, a small thing. So you might wonder why the, the worst case bias and the worst case variance. We actually can also prove for a slightly improved version of that, where we take the infimum over the variance under one additional assumption that is uh, quite weak. And that makes uh, the lower bound of actually much, much sharper because it also shows that like the variance everywhere has to be lower bound. It's not just the worst case uh, phenomenon. OK, so this is for the regression model. Now let me go on to the high dimensional uh, model because that's uh, another thing we, we might be interested in. Um, and so how is the situation? For high dimensional models, and just to illustrate the approach, I have taken the simplest high dimensional model that uh, one can imagine. That is, we observe um, n. Um, uh, we have we, we have a sample of n observations, and they are sampled from a normal distribution with an unknown mean theta i and uh, say standard uh, variance one, and they are independent. And so we assume that. Uh, the mean vector consisting of the vector, uh, the entries theta one to theta n, is as sparse. That means only s of the uh, entries are non-zero. And say s for uh, for the result here, s needs to be smaller than uh, say square root of n. And um, if we analyze this, then we have a sort of bias variance trade off if we decompose the mean squared error. And this is given here on the slide of what the bias variance trade off is. So the, the variance is actually the, the sum of the variances of the individual components. And uh, the bias um, is this uh, L2 norm of the, 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 the individual biases of, of, the, of the components. 
And applying now the, the general abstract framework for deriving lower uh, bounds on the bias variance trade-off gives us then the following result. It says if the if the bias is is small, okay, so the bias, the, the squared bias is bounded by let's say a gamma, gamma is a constant, gamma times s log n over s squared. So s over s times log n over s s not s squared, it doesn't really matter because it's in the log. Is actually the, the optimal rate that we can achieve. So if the, the bias is essentially of the optimal rate of the order of the optimal rate, uh, and that's bounded by the, the constant here is taken to be gamma, then we have a lower bound on the variance. And that is interesting. So the lower bound on the variance is for one specific point, it's at zero, and uh, it's n times, and then there's a ratio s squared over n to the power of four gamma. So um, you see if the gamma becomes small, the variance, the lower bound of the variance will uh, tend to be n of the order n, which is highly suboptimal. Okay, so that means the, the bias variance trade off here is a bit different. It's not the sort of U-shaped curve, it's even a more extreme phenomenon where we have more sort of phase transition thing because the, the gamma in the bias, the, 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 the constant in the bias, Will influence somehow the lower the, the rate in the, uh, the, the 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 exponent in the in the lower bound, and uh, once the, the the constant is made small, the lower bound will be very bad. So we have a highly suboptimal procedure. And again, that tells us that bias variance trade off is not avoid uh, avoidable, and it's even much stronger than in the regression setup. What we can prove here is a lower bound. Right, it's also not for the worst case variance, it's for one specific point. Um, and it shows us that also the constant has to be essentially good enough in order that we get um, um, good rates for the overall rates for the variance. And also here in this case, again, we have an upper bound that is attained for this uh, so-called uh, soft uh, shrinkage estimator, soft thresholding estimator, and uh, the upper bound matches the lower bound up to some some constants in the exponent, but it doesn't really matter too much. Okay, so also in this case, for high dimensional model, the, the bias range trade off is universal <coughs> and cannot be improved by any method. Um, okay, so I have been talking about um, the non parametric question model and the point wise estimation before. For um, most of the machine learning methods, um, what is the most interesting thing is really prediction error, and that means essentially we are interested in a sort of integrated risk, um, say <clears throat> over the domain, say over the, the data on are on zero one, the the design is on zero one. So <coughs> uh, in this case, um, we want to have uh, some sort of bias range trade off on the integrated uh, risk, and that would really correspond to the plot I have been showing you before on the uh, on the double descent phenomenon that is also for the integrated risk. And again, instead of working in the non-parametric regression uh, problem because it has so much discretization effects, I just work in the simplified uh, Gaussian white noise model. And if we then decompose the prediction error, we see that also the it has also sort of bias variance trade off, which is of course very well known. And the bias is here, the, the, the bias part is the integrated uh, squared bias, and the variance is the integral over the, the, the individual variances. And now, what we can wonder is is there a bias variance trade off for these integrated uh, bias and integrated variance? And this also for minimax lower bounds, um, the, the L2. Case is a very very hard problem, and also for the minimax lower bound uh, for the um, lower bounds on the bias variance trade off, the uh, this turns out to be an extremely difficult uh, problem to, to to derive something explicit here. So um, the, the this change of expectation inequalities that I have introduced before, they are not sufficient here actually to prove a lower bound. And there's a good reason why that is, and that has to do with uh, certain super efficient uh, estimators that um, that can exist on, on for, for these problems. 
Instead, what we do need to do is we need um, to combine it with the, what we call reduction techniques. So, uh, and we, we have two different types of reduction techniques. So the first one that we apply is we, we show that uh, a lower bound for the um, bias range trade off in a in a simpler model, actually, in a, again, a sort of Gaussian sequence model will apply uh, will will imply a a lower bound for the bias range trade off in the in the Gaussian white noise model for exactly these uh, for this L two prediction type loss that I introduced on the previous slide. So that means essentially we can study a simpler model, study lower bounds for bias range trade off in a simpler model, and then we have already a result in the more complicated model. That makes it much, much easier. And then we have a second simplification, and that is very crucial, and that tells us that we essentially only need to study estimators. We can constrain the, the class of estimators to a class of uh, estimators that have additional symmetry properties namely you know, some sort of uh, spherical uh, symmetry. And uh, once we have done that, uh, essentially the, the remaining part can be done by the um, change of expectation inequalities that I mentioned before, and it's just a few lines argument to, to derive these lower bounds. And then what we get is um, what I have written here on this slide. It tells us that, um, again, a bit like the same type of statement as in the pointwise case, so if we uh, raised the uh, integrated bias to the power one over beta, where beta is the smoothness of the function. And um, we take the worst case bias and uh, multiply that with the uh, worst case integrated variance. And this product is lower bounded by uh, one over uh, hn, where n is the sample size. And so that means, again, so that is a universal lower bound that applies to any method um, that, that can be, that can be uh, used here. And so it uh, again, gives you a sort of U-shaped um, bias variance trait of um, also for the integrated loss or prediction type errors. Um, and again, um, we can show that also many estimators that are used in practice actually attain um, this U-shaped um, uh, uh, loss here in the sense that they also have an upper bound of this expression that is of the order 1 over n. So the lower bound of the product of the bias to the power 1 over beta times the variance is of the order 1 over n, and the upper bound is also of the order 1 over n. And so they are really optimal in this, in this sense. OK, so that means um, nothing. Um, yeah, or it's, it's not possible to, to beat the bias variance trade off by, by, for instance, also not by over parameterization. And at the end, we were also wondering a bit on uh, so what happens now if we deviate a bit from, from bias variance trade off? There are many concepts in, in the statistical literature that have been proposed to. Um, yeah, uh, generalize the bias variance trade off, for instance, to classification where it's not so clear how to how to define it, or um, yeah, to to weaken it or to make it stronger. There are many many variations of this of this concept in the literature. So we were wondering whether this sort of approach that we that we propose can also be applied if we take instead um, uh, a, a, a slightly uh, variation of this of the bias variance trade off concept. And uh, one thing that is very natural to do here is instead of looking at the bias variance trade off, you look at the trade off between bias and the mean absolute deviation, where the mean absolute deviation, just to remind you, is uh, given here on the slide. It's the, say, say L1 distance between the, the estimator and a centering point that can be either the mean or the median. And so it's, uh, say, it's the mean, then the mean absolute deviation is upper bounded by the, by the standard deviation, but it can be, of course, much smaller than the standard deviation because uh, the standard deviation can be driven by, by large deviations of the estimator, and then the mean absolute deviation would be smaller. So we were wondering whether we can do something similar for the 
for the trade-off between um, bias and mean absolute deviation. Um, and in fact, we could derive an, an extension of our expect, uh, change of expectation inequalities for, for this case as well. And um, we could also apply it to the first case that I mentioned before, where we are interested in a mean squared error for in the non-parametric regression model. And we can show some lower bounds on the bias range, uh, on the on the bias and uh, mean deviation, mean absolute deviation trade-off in, in, in this case as well. So in, in fact, um, we could extend it, and I think it can be extended to many other frameworks as, as well, for instance, also to classification. Uh, but this uh, has to be done, that is uh, uh, future work. Okay, to uh, wrap up. Um, what have we? Well, what was the, 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 the talk about? So um, the question was: Is there a way, for instance, by overparametrization or whatever, to to uh, get, for instance, uh, methods that have a negligible small bias but uh, still have good uh, statistical performance in in the sense of a small generalization error? And uh, we have shown that um, this is not possible. Um, of course, so it's not possible, but of course, there's a bit of a question here because the, it's always about the formulation of the bias variance state of. So, what we have been, um, what, what has been proved is in some cases, it's really a, a worst case bias variance state of. That means the, the worst case parameter, uh, if we multiply, like those, then we have a lower bound. But that, of course, leaves the option that on a large subset of the parameter space, we can still beat the bias variance trade off. That is still possible. We have some partial results in this direction as, as well. But in general, like in the uh, uniformly over the, over the parameter space, it's, it's impossible to, to improve on the bias variance trade off. Now you can wonder. Uh, so what is then happening here? Maybe I go back to this. I have a few minutes left, and I can go back to the slide. So, so what is now happening in this over-parameterized regime? So if it goes uh, down again, I'm not sure whether you can see my cursor. So this is the, the classical u shape curve, and this is what we see here again on the, in, on the, uh, in for, for this machine learning methods. And then we have the, the, the double descent. Um, so what happens here? So we would assume that the bias, because if we add parameters, we would assume the bias um, decreases uh, all the time and gets smaller if we add more parameters. And the variance will first, um, well, the variance will, will increase. And then once we come to the new regime, the variance will decrease again. Um, but this is not true. This is impossible, essentially, what we, what we have shown. Uh, what will happen actually is also that uh, the bias will have to increase again. Okay? So not only the, the variance will decrease in this new regime, but also the bias has to, to uh, increase. And that comes then through the stochastic gradient descent, for instance. Yeah? So that will induce regularization and that will induce also a bias um, in, the, in the reconstruction. So in essentially, what, what happens here with this new regime, we, we enter in a different type of, of method. Yeah? So once we are in the new regime, we, you, you can view this as a, having a, a different sort of method, but it still has to, it still has to be uh, within this bias range train, uh, framework. So there's nothing we can do. And all these um, papers here that I mentioned here that say, well, this is a a completely different story for the in the overparametrized case. I think that is that cannot be really um, confirmed based on the theoretical analysis that we have that we have done. Okay, just to to summarize, um, another thing that we have seen is that depending on the on the statistical model, there are different versions of the bias range trade off. They can be more stronger and weaker. And for instance, in the high dimensional model, we have been able to prove a very, very strong uh, bias variance trade-off, which is uh, also not U-shaped. Um, it's, it's it has a bit of a different shape. 
And um, so the U-shaped biosphere and straight of that is really something that is very much related to, say, function estimation problems. Um, good. Uh, so here, maybe now I, I stop here. If you are interested in more details and uh, all the proofs, then you should uh, consult uh, the paper. And uh, here's the link for the paper. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, OK. Thank you so much, Johannes, for a very nice talk. So uh, so maybe there's for a question time. Uh, Are there any audience as to post the questions here? Uh, just to turn on the mic on and ask the Johannes for questions. Hi, Johannes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a question. So, um, so um, you actually uh, 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 prove some bias variance uh, bounds, uh, trade-off bounds for um, that applies to all over-parametrized regimes. But uh, can you still justify the over-parametrized regime is better than the uh, the old re the classical regime? So, so uh, uh, how mm -hmm. about we consider the total, the sum of the bi bias square and the variance? So, uh, can you still show some advantages of for going into the uh, over parametrized regime? Um, a very good, very good question, yeah. So actually, I think I can prove that the over parametrized regime is, is worse in terms of bias variance <laughs> trade-off in, in many cases. Um, so I have another uh, paper that I have not been talking about uh, today. And this shows that for denoising problems, okay, so if you have additive noise in your data, uh, what will happen is you will, in the over parametrized regime with stochastic gradient descent applied to a shallow network, you will uh, convert to a uh, interpolant of the data because you're over parametrized, so you will convert to something interpolating your data points. And it will interpolate uh, in a way it's, it converts essentially to this natural cubic spline interpolant. Um, we know this, we, or we can prove that. And this natural cubic spline interpolant has very bad uh, bias variance state of properties. So it has a, a, a small bias, of course, but it has an exploding uh, variance. So that makes the mean squared error makes it very, very bad. Um, so what I believe is this over parametrized regime is very good in cases where you have some sort of um, interpolation type problems. Okay, so you have maybe noise in the in the design, but there's no additive uh, noise in the response and the design. You see, if you have an image of a cat, then the whole information that this is a cat is essentially encoded into the image. So there's no external information of or so that you don't. You, you don't have, but uh, in the classical statistics framework, we have noise also in the response. So there's as a part that is not explained by the axis about the y's, and in those cases, the over over parametrized regime will tend to interpolate the data in a in a bad way. That makes the bias small, but it makes the the variance uh, sort of exploding. But on the other hand, if you have a sort of interpolation type problem like, uh, yeah, so all the information about the y's is in the axis, and the, x, the axis can be random if you like. In those cases, the, this is exactly what you want to do. You want to, you want, you want to interpolate the data in, in a sense, and then I think then it works. And that is also a bit, I think, where, where you see the, the application. So I can also show you here just, maybe I can go back to this, to this plot here. Okay, so this is something I, Last year I was a visitor at this, there was a special semester in, at the Simons Institute in, in Berkeley, and we had a lot of discussions about this, whether uh, over parametrization is no good or bad. And then we, 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 made, this, we made this plot um, just to check it because we identified the setup. But what you see here is if you look into the plot, you see also in this case uh, the risk in the over parametrized regime is much larger than the the optimal bias variance trade off in the classical regime. The, the whole thing is that because of the 
yeah, um, scale, you, you don't see that, you don't see that so much, but uh, it's certainly a, a couple of times um, worse than what you would have achieved uh, if you would have just chosen the bias variance trade off in the, in the optimal way. Can, can, can you see that? Um, the, it's a slightly above the, 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 the x axis on, in the over parameterized regime. On, on, in the classical regime, it's on the x axis. So there, there's a small gap. And this, and this one is small. The gap here is small because the, we took the, the noise to be a small number. But if you increase the noise level in the data, the, the gap will become worse. 